Hi, I'm Sanera Madani, and I'm a mom of two, a daughter of an immigrant and an unlikely entrepreneur who went from scaling an idea to a billion dollar business. Yes, a billion dollar business. Along the way, I learned that less than 2% of female founders ever hit 1 million in revenue. And I became obsessed on a mission to change that. I believe that there is so much gatekeeping in business knowledge and that we as female entrepreneurs should be learning from other female founders and leaders who have broken the statistics. Since I never went to CEO school, I've had to learn it all the hard way, but you shouldn't have to because we believe that you deserve to have it all. And honestly, nothing bad happens when women make more money. Grab a seat because class is officially in session. Welcome to CEO School. Hello, everyone. Welcome to CEO School. I'm your host, Sanira Madani. And today I'm literally so excited for, I'm always excited for our episodes every single Monday. But today I just feel like I found my my future best friend. And her name is Sunana Sinha Haldia. And she sold her um, investment company, a capital company, Sabil Capital, to Raymond James, which is a fortune Fortune 500 bank. And uh, she's in New York City. And I cannot wait for you to hear her story of founding a company as a brown woman, as a mother of three. She is a wine enthusiast. She serves on um, so many different boards. She also is a, um, uh, she's a guest lecturer at Stanford University. I mean, all the things. And did I mention she is also a wine sommelier? I mean, and in finance. Uh, Sanana, I am so excited to have you on the show today. Welcome to CEO School. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to speak with you today. I know. We didn't even get a chance to do, usually before the show, I like to have the guest on and we'll do like five, 10 minutes of of just conversation. So I know like, we know what are their biggest, what are the things that we want to talk about? What are things off limits? But honestly, I didn't even give Sanana a chance because I have so many questions for you and I knew it was going to be so juicy off the bat. So I didn't want to, I didn't want even want you to give me the good stuff ahead. I want you to All just right. give it to me raw on the show. Okay. So Sanana, tell me about your entrepreneurial uh, journey. How did you start an investment company as a young brown woman? I mean, you and I are probably not even maybe I you a few years apart. Um, I don't even know which direction. You're very, very young. And not only did you start a uh, a finance company, an investment company, you ended up selling your wealth management practice to one of the largest banks in America. Uh, and you are now the global head of private capital advisory for Raymond James. How did this happen? So, so you know, life happens to you when you're busy planning it. And that's my first lesson to all CEOs and all entrepreneurs listening to this, right? You can put the best life plans and business plans together, but you've got to be able to roll with the punches as they come in. I thought I had my life all figured out. I had a great trajectory working in-house, employed by two large asset managers. And the GFC hit, the great financial crisis hit, where there was a lot of turbulence in the financial markets in general. And I was busy left scratching my head going, what do I do next? How do I find a role for myself where I feel valued, that I feel like I'm in control of my destiny, but yet I'm doing what I love to do in the asset management industry at large. And by accident, I fell into the idea of starting my own boutique advisory practice, Sibio Capital, because Uh, really out of a sense of market need that I had established when I was working in-house, that, listen, there doesn't seem to be an advisor of quality out there who can be a real pot partner, a strategic partner to private equity firms out there. That's what led me to start Sibio Capital. I started with one client day one, who was an early backer of mine, and one became two at the end of the first month. It was just myself in the beginning out of the spare bedroom of of my apartment, And I built the business from there, step by step, adding clients, then adding employees and growing the business to a transatlantic firm. By the time we sold it, we had three offices, New York, LA and London. Now we have five, by the way. Uh, And Raymond James had come knocking saying, listen, we're really interested in acquiring a business such as uh, yours. We like two things about you. We like what you do. What you're doing is really unique and creative and complex in this part of finance. But also, we like the fact that you built this business so so differently, so diversely. That the two went together when it came to our value proposition to Raymond James. So the, the other big lesson out of my story is 
don't hesitate to build something differently and build it to your own liking because someone will recognize that it's unique and that's what makes you stand out at the end of the day. I love it. I love this so much. I have so many questions for you. I mean, what made you want to like, you you know, you made it sound so simple that, you know, you got your first, you know, private equity client, you know, for those that don't know finance and private equity. um, And I know this very well, probably not as well as you, but I've been on the fundraising side of capital. And, uh, you know, it is not easy at all, especially as a woman. And I have firsthand lived this, and not only as a woman, but also a minority woman. So can you just walk me through what the hell was going on in your head when you decided to go start uh, this business? Because it is it was almost doomed to fail before it even began. It really was. And I have to say, not just at what ha- made me start it, but also after I started it, Sunira, it was not without its challenges and its knocks. And I'll come to that in a second. But Really, when I started the business, I was 30 years old. It's been 11 years. You all can do the math yourself as to how old I am. I look young, but I'm not that young anymore. But when I started the business, I started it with the following rationale. I wanted to do something different, and I wanted to do something on my own terms and see how far it went. I had the confidence in myself. This is when it comes back to the whole imposter syndrome that so many young women these days suffer from. I did not have that at the time. At the, at the time, I knew that I had added significant value while I was employed so that if I started off on my own and became an entrepreneur, I would give it my best shot. I gave myself a timeline and I gave myself KPIs. I said, listen, at the end of the first year, I want to be able to have done A, B, and C. I told you she was going to be my best friend. Yes. I want to have done A, B, and C, and I want to be able to show that I am on the right track here. Otherwise, I'm going to go back and go get a job and get some more experience and maybe I'll try another entrepreneurial idea. Entrepreneurship lives in my blood. I will give you a funny story. I remember after my very first job, which was as an analyst, like junior analyst fresh out of college, at the leaving party, because I was leaving that firm to go to a sister firm, the CEO of that company, in this is back in San Francisco Bay Area, said, listen, honey, let me just tell you right now. I know you're going from one job to another, but I don't see you working for very long. You're going to end up starting your own business. You're an entrepreneur through and through. So I knew I was going to get on the entrepreneurial bandwagon at some point and start my own firm and build it. It was a question of, was this the right thing to do at the right time? And the answer to me is that we never know. As we're starting out as entrepreneurs, we have no idea if we're doing this correctly and incorrectly. What we do know is that, listen, given the information that's presented in front of me today, what can I do with it? How can I inch this thing forward by a little millimeter today and another millimeter tomorrow, but I want to set myself some clear goals and clear KPIs to see if I'm moving towards those goals or not. Otherwise, I'm going to back up and say, hey, what, what else can I be doing here? Okay. By the way, you're officially hired uh, as, a, as a mentor and coach for CEO school because that is the exact formula. And my story is very similar in a different way, but just having the right KPIs and milestones is so, so important. I'd love to also for the women that may not be familiar with um, capital markets and with um, with the world of finance, could you in layman's terms just explain what is it that your firm does uh, and what you're now doing for Raymond James? Yes. Yeah, so what I'm doing for Raymond James, I've done for the last 11 years throughout Sibyl. Sibyl continues, but now under the Raymond James banner. So what is it that we do? You know, all those private equity funds that you all hear about, whether it's a venture fund or a growth fund or a private equity fund, think about the big names, the middle names, the small names in private equity you've heard about. We raise capital for their funds. That is the simplest way to describe us. We, we raise capital for private equity so they can then invest in companies. We also help those private equity funds and those private equity managers arrange liquidity at their company level, liquidity at their own level. So we're liquidity solutions provided to them because private equity is private, it's illiquid. Oftentimes people don't wanna hold for the full duration of a company staying private. As you know, the trend over the last 10 years has been private for longer. But guess what? Everybody wants liquidity at some point, especially with the markets now turning. Oftentimes those private equity funds turn to someone like ourselves to organize that liquidity and we help raise new capital into their own private equity programs. So that's the simple version of what we do. Okay, and then I'm gonna simplify it further, if that's okay Please. too. So just so, so, so we talk about investors, right? And so we talk about investors that are investing in your companies, in my company, in other companies. 
investors that are larger investors that are part of a fund, so not angel investors, but angel investors are individual investors. Private equity investors are a, like a group of investors that come together and there's a fund manager or a thesis of like, these are the styles of investments that they're going to take on. So there's private equity. That's what it's called. So it's private capital. It's not in the public market. Public market would be, you know, where you're able to buy stocks in a company. Um, but in the private equity market, they're deploying their capital or the capital of their investors. So even private equity funds also have investors. Right. And so what Sunaina helps do is she helps to make sure that they need to raise capital. So she's actually helping them raise capital so that they can then invest in companies like mine and yours. And it kind of, so she's almost like the master boss of the private equity. Like, so the money kind of comes all the way to the top to Sunaina. So I just wanted to maybe paint that little, that visual of how the money kind of flows all the way down to what we know as like an investment into, into a company. But even our private equity group has to raise their own capital to go get capital. And that's where Sanana really helps is those private equities. So she's dealing it with it on the private equity level. Is that correct, Sanana? That's exactly right. You distilled it perfectly. That's perfect. Okay. Perfect, perfect. So now I'm not going to bore you guys with finance details because not everybody geeks out like I do about it. Okay. But I agree with you fully. You said that you wanted to start your... So you didn't have the imposter syndrome, which I really envy you because... Um, I think that that was really short lived for me. I think when I first got started, it was like I had all this like vigor and passion and like, um, you know, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go change the world. And then I actually got into like my first set of challenges and the no's and not having anybody look like me across the table to, you know, offer me a hand, you know, and I think that's where the imposter syndrome really started to have like for me where it came place wasn't actually from myself. It was from not seeing other people like me succeed. And so that caused doubt in my own mind. How did you kind of overcome some of those challenges um, in such a male-dominated industry? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and let me also be clear that the, the feeling associated with imposter syndrome hit me you know, quite a bit in those early days. But I had a way to overcome it, and I'm going to tell you how. Um, one tell is very um, mentally acute in terms of what I focus on when those feelings arrive. And the second one is a centering, rebalancing way and that I've lived my life for the last decade or so. The first way, which is much more mentally acute, is listen, I know what I've delivered in terms of value. I keep that running checklist in my head. I kept it in my head when I was working for people. I kept it in my head when I started my own firm. And Sometimes it was not enough to keep it in my head. I had to actually write it down. And I look at that whenever that imposter syndrome used to hit, right? That if someone told me, hey, I'm going to pass on you and I'm going with so-and-so of your competitor, which, by the way, would happen every week, every month. We, I, we did knocks and the challenges were very, very large in the early years of trying to scale this business. I would look at that and say, actually, I have delivered this much value and I've done all these amazing things already for these other people. Now it's my turn to do it for myself. So that's one thing. That's an easy thing for us all to do as women as, as, and as entrepreneurs, men or, or women, make a list of what has brought us to this place because something in there is encouraging you to take this leap. Write it down or make sure it's front and center for you so you can revisit it when times do get tough. The second is I, I started that. meditating very early on in life. Even once a year now, I go on a Vipassana meditation course. I meditate every single morning, come what may. So I have trained my brain to reset. Okay, My brain will take a knock, will take an, something annoying, will take any feeling, happy, sad, angry, in all its flavors, and know how to reset back to center. And my big, if I can leave you and all your listeners with one thing, it is find a way to train the brain. The brain is a muscle. We go to the gym and we work out our biceps and we go work out our glutes and we go work out on our stretching abilities in this muscle and that muscle. What are you doing to train your mind and control your mind? Because if you don't control your mind, your mind's going to come control you, right? You know those buzzing sounds in your head and you can't sleep at three in the morning or you know, when anxiety comes and overrides or anger or excitement, whatever the emotion is, how do you bring it back to center and say, okay, reset time, centering time, and we'll, we'll move on knowing that this too shall change. That exercise happens over years of practice. And it doesn't matter if you're practicing five minutes or one hour. 
Start with five minutes and then that becomes seven, becomes 10. It's just like exercise for any other part of your body, but try not to leave it till you're fixing it, right? So things have gotten to a, such a point where you're finding people to help fix things. Do it proactively, invest in your mind and its ability to recenter and your ability to control it early on. And that has paid dividends to me. People ask all the time, what is the secret to your success? Three young children, growing this business, this and the other. I say only one answer. I have the ability to come and come back to center every single day because of the meditation muscle. For me, it's come through a Vipassana meditation and I swear by it, but all types of meditation will help you do that. I'm going to pause you here because one, I want to recap what you said on if you don't control your mind, your mind controls you. And that is 100% factual. I love that we're going down this path right now. And I want to kind of stay in this path about meditation because it is one of the hardest things, especially, you know, when you're entrepreneurial, you have this natural, um, like many entrepreneurs have ADHD, right? We can't, like our minds wander. Our minds are, we're busy, think we're frantic. We have so many things to solve for. I literally call it all my tabs are always open. That's how I feel. Yes. I feel like my tabs are always open. And at the end of the night, even when I go to sleep, I like turn off. I have to like close out my tabs. And I'm probably one of those humans. And I think many entrepreneurs can relate that we are able to have all of these tabs open. And it looks like chaos to people who are not entrepreneurs or that can't have this organized chaos living. But my tabs are always going. And I know exactly where I'm at across each of those different tabs or categories. Yep. And so it's very difficult, actually for, I think it's the most difficult thing. I, I practice a lot of different ways for mindfulness and, and I, I journal. And that's kind of one of the things that has really helped me. That's kind of my meditation and a way that I've yeah. been able to practice, um, mindfulness, but I struggle, Sunina, um, with the art of stillness, with the art of silence. And so I would love for you to talk to me a little bit about, you, you mentioned a type of meditation that you, uh, that you do. And then you talked about, you do like a, a retreat once a year. And then, yeah. so can you t give us a little bit more on this? Because I know the women here, cause I know I'm really interested in this and the women are definitely, yeah. um, interested. So if you could share some details here, we would love to know that secret. I would love to tell you more. It is my favorite subject to talk about. And it is my superpower. My one and only superpower has come from meditation. It is the meditate. It is the practice of meditation, right? Because I can then focus my attention anywhere I choose and go 100% into that and know that when it's time to pull back, I've done my best. Now I'm leaving the rest. I'm surrendering the outcomes. I've put in the inputs. I'm done with the outcomes. I'm no longer attached to the outcomes. And that as an entrepreneur is the hardest thing because we put in all this effort and we're like, where are the, where are the results? And that detachment from results is what we all need to practice. So how did my meditation journey start and what do I do? Everybody can start meditating without any experience whatsoever. The best way to start is go to a course. You can listen to apps, you can listen to online courses for sure, but there's something about investing in yourself. And I do call it an investment in yourself because we're investing the time. Go and immerse in a meditation course, learn the technique, practice it every day with others who are there on the same journey to learn with you. And then you come out with a muscle that at least knows how to do the exercise, right? And then you can practice it every day. If it gets weaker, you can go to another course. So the type of meditation course I attended um, to begin with is called Vipassana, spelled V-I-P-A-S-S-A-N-A. -S -S totally free. They have... 30, over 30 centers in the United States, all over the East Coast, Midwest, West Coast, all over Europe and Asia as well. You, can, you go, it is free to attend. You can give a donation at the end of your course, never in the beginning. And it's not even required for you to give a donation. But they will teach you over the course of a week-long meditation camp how to meditate from A, B, C, right? Literally like a toddler, being taught letters for the first time, they'll teach you how to train the brain. And they'll teach you the technique from cradle to grave. So you come out of that course going, I know how to do this. So you go home and you sit down to meditate. If all you manage that day is seven minutes, no problem. Five or seven minutes is enough to start. And then you go longer. Hey, this week I'm going to try for eight minutes. 
You do that for three, four weeks. Hey, this week I'm going to try it for nine minutes. Let me see if I can sit for 10 minutes. And you get your brain to be still and quiet using the technique they taught you for longer and longer periods of time. And your brain gets stronger and stronger once a year, come rain or shine, come pregnancies, breastfeeding my three children. It doesn't matter how much is going on on the work front. There's always too much happening on the work front. You never feel it's a good time to go. But guys, let me tell you, if you don't invest in yourself, and if you don't find the center and rebalancing force within you, you just keep getting twisted and turned in the wings of life. And so I make sure I go. I have a very I've supported family who've seen the benefits the meditation has given me and are very supportive for me to go. And I make sure I do that once a year only. I don't have to go more than that. But the rest of the time, I meditate every single morning to start my day. Oh, my goodness. I just I'm so inspired by you today. Um, and I really appreciate you sharing just kind of the details here along that. And how long has your practice, like now that you're this, I consider you an expert. So, you know, what's your morning routine like? So I get up very early. I have three kids, nine and under. So it's a very busy and a puppy. Uh, <laughs> let's not forget him. And so uh, they have um, really active lives of their own and they're up between 6.30 and 7. So my golden hour is that 5, 5.15 a.m. hour through to 6.15 before the kids are up. I'm always up in that time zone and I am meditating for an hour. And it doesn't matter if I'm traveling, I travel a lot. I've got four offices in the US where I've got members of my team based. I travel across Europe and the world. I'll make sure I'm up around that time and do my hour of meditation and then I'll start my day. Um, and then of course the morning is all about getting kids ready for school these days, getting them out the door and usually and hopefully in one piece. And then I'll often go get some exercise. I'm either running to work or walking to work, one of the two, um, or I'm going to the gym straight after the kids have gone off to school. And then I'm coming into work and starting my work there around 9, 9.30. And then going all the way through to US hours, our office on the West Coast is, is often the last to close. So I'm often doing at least half that work day with him. And that's a pretty typical day for me. Um, it, it, at, at, at normal, I'll come home in between for a couple hours, put the kids to bed, read them stories, do their homework and stuff. But that's a pretty full on day, as you can see. And it kind of starts with the meditation anchor in the beginning. I'm, uh, you know, just kudos to you and to all the working moms. I'm one myself and I can really relate. I don't get that perfect golden hour in every, um, every day, but, um, if I do, it's definitely the best treat for myself that I give myself. And so it's like the biggest gift that I'm able to give myself. And just, you know, entrepreneurship isn't easy. Then, you know, having children and balancing it all is definitely not easy as well. What are your biggest, you know, um, tips for mothers out there that are entrepreneurs, that are seeking to grow their businesses and really do want to have it all, right? I think that's something for me that I became really passionate around was I just because I, I wanted to be successful, but it was not in lieu of having a family. I wanted to have a family and also be successful in business. And that's not where our patriarchal society, especially in finance and especially in some of the industries that we're in, support, you know, lifestyles to support having and raising, raising a family, not just like you literally had your babies while building your business. I had my babies while building my business. What are the biggest um, aha moments, takeaways, lessons that you can share with our mothers in the room listening today? Yes, I will share three tips for all working moms and entrepreneur moms out there. The number one thing is you have got to keep in mind that you can have it all, just not at the same time, right? It's just not possible to get it all to click into place with check boxes the same day, the same month, the same year. There will be seasons in your life where one or two things will take up the priority. So for example, if you're pregnant or you have a toddler or you have a baby, that is going to take precedence over traveling the world and growing your business and finding new clients and doing international expansion. We do have to make these choices, but just know that in the arc of time, it will all come due to you. It will all come together, but that it's okay to lean in one or two places and know that the others have to just wait for their season. So that's the first thing. That's called acceptance in another way. And we have to accept because there's so many uh, women out there who come to me for advice 
Um, and also, I've got two younger sisters. I see them go through this. Like, Why isn't it all working? I just had a baby, but my business is going to have to scale and the ARR growth isn't there. And I'm like, listen, it all can't fire on all cylinders. It's kind of the universe's way of saying that if I make it all fire at the same time, you won't be able to cope. Or this little being that you've just had or these little creatures that you have at home are going to suffer. So one thing at a time or a couple of things at a time, that acceptance is really important to have. And this feedback, I wish I'd taken this feedback early on. I was given it by a lovely lady called Tina Selig from the Stanford Technology Ventures Program. I went to Stanford from undergrad. She gave it to me in my te late teens, early 20s as an undergrad. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to have it all. And then guess what? <laughs> no, the life taught me the hard way. Um, there were years when I was pregnant, when the business flat line just didn't grow. And then I had to pedal like mad to get it to grow up the other side of it. It's okay. It's okay for it to be just steady Eddie for that year when you're doing a really difficult job elsewhere in your life. That's number one. And, and part of that is for women and moms to realize accomplishment isn't just a dollar sign. It isn't just the last valuation of your company. Yes. Your accomplishment as a human being is a lot more than that. That includes your mental sanity, right? Second piece of advice is make sure you lean into building a team around you quickly. And of course, you may or may not have a support system at home. That depends on the type of partner you have, the type of family and in-laws. Not going to comment on that because you can't fix that. You can't choose your family in many ways, right? But you can't choose the people you choose you're going to work with. And that includes if you're an entrepreneur or if you're in employment, choose your colleagues. That is up to you. And make sure you choose wisely. People who are going to understand that you're having kids or have had kids. And that means you have a life that you have to juggle around kids. I'm very blessed that I have 42, 43 people who work for me who get it. That there are certain weeks of the year I can't travel because it's school play season or, you know, sports camp season and I need to be dropping kids off and being around for my kids. But other times I'm fair game and I will fly five cities in five days as I often do. So pick your team wisely who understand the mom journey and are going to be good with it. Because if they're going to judge you and make you feel weird about it, you're going to always be conscious and it's just not worth it. And the third piece of advice I have for you, and this is really important, I've already given you the advice for rebalancing and recentering your life. But the third piece of advice that is critical for me to, for all moms out there to know, is that you have got to invest in yourself as a person, right? Leave the meditation out of it completely. That means once a week, figuring out a couple of hours of what did you do for yourself? Could be sitting on the couch and reading a book. Could be dodging out and watching a show. It could be getting, you know, to going to the salon and, and, and making sure you get your hair done. I don't care what it is, but find that time. Otherwise, there's two things start happening, resentment and entitlement. And they're cousins of each other. They seem to show up together, right? You start resenting what you are doing, stop enjoying it, you stop living it mean mindfully. And then with it comes an entitlement of, I should be doing that. I should have that. I should. Then you're no longer living the life of, that you have in front of you. You're living what I call the deferred life plan where you're hoping to get to something else. You're living to get to something else. You're living just to get through this phase. That's a very slippery slope. But guess what? That tomorrow doesn't come. That tomorrow has its own disappointments and challenges. So invest in yourself. Find ways of bringing yourself back to where you can recognize yourself again, however that may be for you. So you've got enough to give the next day. I mean, I could not have like, pay, I, I didn't pay you to be here, but I could, I, I should have paid you to be here because honestly, you are my soul sister. Like you are literally my soul sister. And every single thing that you just said is the exact message that I, I call it the three bucket principle, saying no to things, right? Like you can have it all, just not all at once. And you decide what all looks like for you in the categories that you want to define those. But we're not on a rat race. Right. And so there's so many things that you said that I'm like, oh my God, yes, just keep this was just so this is just so um powerful. I love hearing you speak on all of these topics. I thought I have so many questions for you that I'm not even gonna get to around your exit, around, you know, about what took place after. Like I had so many business questions for you today, but I actually loved where the conversation went, which means that I have to invite you back, Sanana, back at CEO school, back at one of our retreats, back as a speaker somewhere, back at 
are, um, you know, even when you talked about investing in yourself, right? We have to invest in ourselves in whatever category that looks like. I um, am just, I'm just honored that you're here today. I feel like I really did. I knew we were going to be friends before I, I looked, I read a little bit about you and I was like, she sounds very similar uh, to me. And then tell me about you being a wine sommelier because I that was like definitely on my list of things to ask. So forget business. Let's talk about well, wine. Wine has ended up being my answer to golf. I work in the financial services industry where they all golf and I do not know how to swing a Yes. Uh, and I, I started learning about wine really early on back when I was in the Bay Area at Stanford, going up to Napa and Sonoma. I was asked to put together um, all the leading sommeliers and speakers from Napa into a wine class at Stanford that I ran for a few years. We learned even more about wine then. And then when I moved to London a, a few years later, I decided to put all that wine knowledge to the test and study and take the Court of Master Sommeliers test. Lo and behold, I passed. It wasn't easy, but it was a very memorable three-day test. Uh, and now what I do is I use it as a hobby and as a way to connect with lots of folks in the private equity and financial services world. world. They all seem to enjoy wine. Yes. Uh, it gives me a point of conversation and connection that isn't golf-related, which, by the way, I, I yeah, no, that's not me. I love it. I feel like I have a, again, I'm going to... I love wine. And part of my journey started off in when I studied abroad in Rome, but it also really developed specifically in the finance industry of so many dinners to go to, so many different things to go to. That's right. I don't golf. I don't, I'm, I mean, I'm yay sports. I love going to sport events, whatever they are. So I do all of that because um, I love like live things. But, you know, food and wine was a way for me to connect with almost any human. And uh, yes. it's important to have that connection, especially when you're in finance, you're also in a sales role as, you know, as CEO hey. um, and running a business. And you, you know, you have to be, I think that people don't realize one of the biggest things that people don't realize is how much like wor you work. I think that that's a big misconception. So you have your day work, yes. but then you have your, the conferences, you said you travel five days yeah. um, at, you know, at times you have international offices, you are, you know, at dinners and events and just so many things that you have right. to do that fall outside of the office hours that sometimes my That's staff right. sees me in and they think that, oh, I'm just, I'm off. And what you see on social media is she's just traveling or doing, you know, other things, but it's literally all work all the time. And it's so difficult right. to also balance that while having a family and setting rules yeah. and, I just I feel like I relate to you on so many on so many levels and that's probably one of the biggest challenges for me is not being able to turn off turning off work um and having boundaries and having those things like I don't travel for more than 2 days away from my kids but when I go west coast and I'm in east coast I, I try to knock out as many meetings as I can so I don't have to go back to west coast back and forth and so it's just right. and then you're exhausted out. by the time you get home because you're like oh my god i did like seven meetings in a day and now i took a red eye i'm like i'm dead yes and then you still have to like get your kid to like crazy hat day in the morning and doctor's appointments right. and whatever i'm like literally next week and i think the biggest friend that i've made is organization so as much as it's all like the chaotic like it's like organized chaos with all my tabs in my head i think something that's really worked for me and I really preach is systems, right? Like that's one thing that I'd love to get your final perspective on. We're definitely going to have you back, Sanana. So audience that's listening, we'll have her have her back, hopefully before the end of the year as well. But Sanana, what are some systems that you use to, you talked about meditation, but how do you manage all of this time, right? So do you have any like systems in place that you're like, go try this, go do this. This is what works for me. Yes, I think I love what you say about systems because I'm, I, and I totally relate to tabs. I have tabs open and actually quite literally, I'm swear by Trello boards where you can have the tabs and you can project manage your to-do list. So you're talking about fellow project manager here. So yes, ladies, project manage the heck out of your to-do list. And I love, I will often write things down just so I can check them off. I'm such a check the boxer in terms of what's on the list and how much can we cross up today. Number one, ladies, and this is really important, delegate, delegate, delegate. Mm. Who can you delegate to? You can delegate to your partner. You can delegate to a nanny. You can delegate to family around you, their parents, et cetera, they're helping. Do you have an assistant? If you are a CEO and you don't have an assistant, you are not investing in yourself and in your business because there are all these things that have such a low ROI for your time but still need to get done. We, we have a thousand of those things every day. 
Even if it's not an assistant in person, get a virtual assistant, get an assistant share, get some hours from an assistant somewhere. So a lot of this tasky stuff you can give up your plate. If something comes on my ta on my list, the first question I ask myself is, who can this go to? If it cannot go to anyone else, and really ask yourself twice, do I really have to do this? Or can someone else give this a shot for me? Can I train someone to do this for me, whether it's on my home front or a business front? So that's my first question. If it has to go to me, the first thing I do is I put it on a list somewhere. As you said, put it on, open one of the tabs and put it on there. So it doesn't get missed because so much information is guzzling at me, work and personal, three kids, three different activity rosters, a husband, family, et cetera, et cetera. I gotta have it all organized so it has to go on a list somewhere or it's gonna get dropped. If it stays on the list for more than three weeks, does it still need to get done, right? So it's that two by two, that HPS two by two of the urgent importance, low, low urgency, low, low importance. I will often, once a month, look at my to-do list and plot this stuff. What is urgent and important? That gets done first. What is important and not urgent? That gets done second. Then everything else, right? So if it's less important, but then urgent, who can do it? Can someone else do it if it's less important? And if it's low, low, maybe I don't have to do it at all. Maybe it just got added there because someone really wanted me to take care of it, but I just don't have the ability or the time or the inclination to do it. I have the biggest I'm smile on my face because I literally did an entire module in our course. And I know my producer's looking at me because he's like, we're over time, but this is such yeah, so yeah. good. We're going to we're gonna go over here. Okay, Carlos, we're going to go over. The, honestly, I literally did an entire module on the scatter plotting of our, like, this is how you become the CEO of your life. We do this in business anyway, but we got to yes. do it in our life. So Nana, this has just been, I feel like I'm looking at a, a, a different mirror version of myself. I'm so excited to get to know you. Love I'm it. in New York City often. Um, I cannot wait to hopefully meet you in person next time I'm up. I'll probably be up in a couple of weeks. I'm, I'm usually there every eight weeks or so. I was actually there this weekend. Um, and so I'm always in New York. And if you're ever in Orlando, you have a friend here. And just on behalf of CO School and all our listeners today, thank you so much for your incredible knowledge and time today. How can we support you? What's next in Sanana's journey? And how can we support you? Where can we find more of you? What can we do to support you? You are so kind. You can support me by going back to point number one, go meditate, find some rebalancing and recentering in your lives. It's as one thing you can take away from this conversation is that you can follow me on LinkedIn and search for my name at Shanena Sinha and you'll find me and follow me and I share all my updates on there. I'm looking forward to sharing this podcast. Amazing. I can't wait. Thank you, Sanana, for all your time today. And ladies, I hope you guys enjoy the show. If you did, screenshot this episode and share it with your social networks because that is how we grow. This is how we get this amazing message across. And I know everyone's got to hear this episode with Sanana and my conversation. I feel like this was so impactful. What a power 35 minutes. And I cannot wait to have you back, Sanana. And ladies, I will see you at our next Wind On Wednesday and with an amazing guest next Monday at CEO school. Thank you for tuning into today's show. If you loved it, leave us a review. We are so proud to bring you authentic conversations, game changer expert guests, and valuable content on and offline. The best compliment you can give us is by screenshotting today's show and tagging us on Instagram at CEO school and at Sanira Madani. We are obsessed with swag. So don't be surprised if we want to send you some. Thanks for tuning into class today. And remember, nothing bad happens when women make more money.